In today's modern world, your border is the interface between yourself and the consumer. Businesses today not only need an online presence, but need to ensure they can deal with an ever-increasing hostile environment. But is traditional security enough, given that modern day attacks mainly focus at the application layer? In this session, I'll illustrate how you can leverage AWS security services in conjunction with the wider AWS platform to create an architecture that dynamically responds to what is occurring in your environment, allowing you to build a self-defending border to protect your online assets. Let's quickly talk about the state of play in business today. In this ever-increasing digital world, the frequency of attacks are increasing year on year. But at the same time, the attack vectors are becoming more and more complex. Businesses are often prolonging and extending out their security investments, sweating out their assets. There are more rules and regulations that need to be adhered to. And let's face it, you know, it can be difficult to be compliant. And lastly, we have a plethora of disparate, disconnected log sources that we struggle to extract value from. So what are the threats facing today's online websites? Look, there are many, so let's quickly talk about them. Firstly, we have the Open Web Application Security Project Style Attacks, or OWASP for short. The OWASP Top 10 is a list of the 10 most dangerous web application security exploits, as well as effective methods for mitigation. We're talking attacks on websites via methods such as SQL injection, cross-site request forgery, insecure deserialization, and so on. The OWASP Top 10 was last updated in 2017. And it's no surprise that number one on the list is injection. Injection occurs when a malicious actor can send hostile data to an interpreter. And almost any, any type of data can be that hostile data. Now, injection is mainly found in legacy applications, but it can be found in SQL and NoSQL queries, LDAP, XML parsers, and SMTP. And whilst you know, it's relatively simple to detect SQL injection when performing static code analysis, injection can result in data loss, corruption of data, disclosure to unauthorized parties, and in some cases, complete host takeover. If we take a look at this simplistic example here, I've decided to log into a website. I've entered in my username and password, which has translated from the web server into a T-SQL query, which is being executed against a database engine, as we can see above. You know, pretty innocent here. But we know not everyone is innocent. And by not validating our user input, in this case, our malicious actor has been able to return all usernames and passwords as a record set. Now, obviously, this would require a bit of massaging to return as HTML, but you, know, you get the idea. Moving on from OWASP-style attacks, we have hacktivists and crime syndicates. These style of attacks are becoming more prevalent and bolder in their target selection. Crime syndicates often target high-profile sites in exchange for monetary funds, pay X bitcoins, buy Y date, or will take your site offline. Whereas hacktivists are more intent in changing the victim's behavior. Individuals can be collateral damage in this fight, and regardless, if you agree with the hacktivist political cause, their methodology and intent remains criminal. Cast your mind back to earlier this year. As a security community, we faced multi-terabit level attacks being performed by publicly accessible memcached servers with UDP access left open. A botnet is a collection of internet-connected devices running one or more bots. Botnets can be used to um, perform distributed denial of service, steal data, and allows the attacker access to the device and its connection. Now, let's take a look at this simplistic example. Now, imagine this being scaled out to hundreds of thousands to millions of devices. Today, botnets are not only for their creators. Having most likely bought the malware that's created the bot, today's owners will either use the botnet for themselves or rent it out by the hour or another arbitrary metric. So how are we fighting these threats? Now, being security professionals, of course, we're going to be using controls. And we have various controls available to provide countermeasures against these types of attacks. But there are problems. The traditional approaches of defending one's border does not scale in terms of effort versus return. Firstly, these proprietary systems are often incredibly expensive, requiring large upfront costs, as well as the use of professional services for implementation. But more importantly, businesses the world over are adopting a DevOps methodology, and these businesses rely on automated deployments. And they often see an opportunity to automate security as well, DevSecOps. 
But these traditional approaches often lack a multi-vendor integration. And lastly, if your website has a high release cadence, you know, hundreds of times per month, how often is security getting in the way of genuine transactions? So enough theory here, let's make this problem real. Let me introduce you to the Snowy Unicorn Elevator Company. Their website is based on the popular commercial off-the-shelf software, WordPress, but they have modified it extensively to work with their ERP and CRM platforms. They have just invented a revolutionary new type of elevator, and because of this, traffic to their website is exploding by orders of magnitude month on month. But with IT not being their core business function, their security posture could be described at best as block and tackle. They are reactive. They make manual firewall changes. They do nothing with their log artifacts, and recently received an email ransom stating the site will be brought offline this Sunday unless they pay 100 bitcoins. Hopefully none of this sounds familiar to anyone here. All right. So before we jump into some demos, let's just trace our architecture. From left to right, users resolve their domain via Amazon Route 53, to which the zone apex resolves to an application load balancer. And to ensure deployed capacity matches user demand, their front end has been deployed in an auto-scaling group. On the back end, they have an RDS database spread across multiple availability zones to provide high availability. They also have a bastion host, which is used for remote administration purposes. And whilst they, they can lock down known ports between, say, their front end, Apache, and their back end, MySQL, being an online business, they need to keep port 80 and 443 open to everyone, including bad actors. Today, I'll be leveraging Kali Linux, and it will form the basis of our attacks. For those who aren't familiar with Kali Linux, Kali Linux is a Debian-derived Linux distribution, perfect for penetration testing and forensic auditing. It contains several hundred tools that are pre-packaged with the operating system that makes it perfect for prodding and poking other systems. It's available in 32-bit, 64-bit, and ARM architectures, and you can find it in the AWS marketplace, as I have done today. So wearing my attacker's hat, what attacks are we going to be performing today? Well, the first thing I need to do is perform a little bit of application discovery. I'm looking for breadcrumbs of information here that will plan, help me plan my attack. So I'm looking for things like HTTP headers, script engine versions, directory structures, and so on. I'm then going to crawl and extract as much information as I can from them, you know, perhaps for a future phishing campaign on their customers. I'll launch some OWASP-style attacks. I'll let a serving of denial of service, and the cherry on top will be a brute force attack. Can we switch to the demo, please? All right, so here we are in Firefox, and as per my description, you know, it's a two-tier stack with Apache on the front end and MySQL on the back end. It's pretty standard stuff, and given that WordPress today constitutes over 30% of websites worldwide, hopefully this has synergies to many of the sites you manage and keep secure yourself. So the first thing we'll be doing today is scraping this website. And in order to do this, we've crafted a simple scraping script. As you can see here, it's just using a combination of curl and wget. Nothing too fancy. So we'll kick this off. Bit too fast for you there. All right, we'll, we'll slow it down later. All right, so whilst that's running, let's take a look at their robots file. And look, for me, who's someone who's familiar with WordPress and has been playing with it for ages, having in the robots file the disallow with the WP admin, it's a pretty clear indicator that I think they're running WordPress. So I think they're running WordPress, but I still don't know that. But what I can do is leverage Kali Linux, and one of the built-in tools of Kali Linux is called WP Scan. So you can download WP Scan as a Docker container, run it on your Mac, your Windows PC. It is built into Kali Linux, but given WP Scan does take some time to run, and we're time limited today, we've run this before the session, and WP Scan is a WordPress vulnerability scanner. So we've run this just before the session, and what we can deduce based on the output of this is their WordPress version is 4.79, so they're a little bit behind on their WordPress patching. Earlier above, we've got a PHP version is 7.016, there is a vulnerability in versions of WordPress less than or equal to 4.94. Now, the current version is 4.95. Um, there's some more vulnerabilities. And finally, they've got a theme, Brooklyn, and a plugin called Apartment Management in their WordPress version. Now, 
the plugin that was detected is called Apartment Management. Now, Apartment Management is a WordPress plugin that has been designed to manage building maintenance tasks. The Snowy Unicorn Elevator Company have repurposed this plugin, not to manage building and maintenance tasks, but to be able to manage the maintenance tasks of their elevators. And one of the functions of this plugin is the ability to send private messages, as we can see here. If anyone decodes this message, please reach out afterwards. Um, so the ability to send private messages. So look, why am I showing you this? Well, the reason I'm showing you this is, whilst WPScan doesn't think this plugin is vulnerable, I've spent a bit of time, probably uh, the better part of a few days, and um, crafted some queries. We're going to perform a multi-stage SQL injection. Now, it's not as simple as just running this directly against the database engine, because, you know, after all, port 3306 is not publicly exposed. And in order for this to be successful, I need an injection vector, and that is going to be the apartment management private messaging system. And to make things a little bit more complicated, I need a multi-field, multi-row record set to return as a single field with a single row. So I've had to encode things and you know, do all sorts of uh, joins, etc. So the first query we're going to run is going to return all the tables contained within their WordPress database. And what stands out to me here is this accounts table, because it doesn't have the same WP underscore prefix as the other tables in their database. Now, I want to know more information about this. So for any of you who are familiar with MySQL or a relational database, you can take a look at the information schema. So we'll run the next query. And what this is showing is the fields contained within this table. And what this shows is this table contains three fields, name, date of birth, and address. So now, since I know what fields are contained in this table, we can run our next query. So look, above the uh, URL is the actual SQL query, and in the uh, URL is that encoded to execute against apartment management. So now, look, since I know what the fields are, we can extract this information. And just like that, they have gone from having a, you know, okay day to having a terrible day. Personal, identifiable information has just been disclosed, including first names, last names, and date of birth. You know, not a good day for them at all. Now, WPScan mentioned before that there was a vulnerability in versions of WordPress equal to less than or equal to 4.94. Now, 4.95 is the current version, so we're not going to uh, tail what's inside this script, but suffice to say, you know, being responsible, for a very small payload that we're sending Apache, Apache is having to respond back in a, with a huge payload. So even if we can't take their site offline, we can cause them significant financial pain by increasing their outbound bandwidth by hundreds of megabits per second. So we're back in Firefox here, and we've reloaded the site. So what I hope will happen here is the website will slow down, come to a crawl, and eventually give up. So it's definitely taking its time. We may need to come back to this. Or can we try amplifying this from, a, for an, from, addition, from an additional session from Kali Linux? All right, so look, it did take a bit of time, but just like that, all nodes in their auto-scaling group, because remember, they're running auto-scaling, are now offline. So every node is now unhealthy. Their website is completely offline. So I mentioned also to you before that their architecture contains a bastion host. Now, look, I know it's not possible to query a DNS zone for an A record that you don't know, but you know, in the wild west of the internet, IP scans with TCP fingerprinting occur at disturbingly high rates. So we're running a port scan over their bastion host, and what this is showing us is that port 3389 is open. And for those who aren't familiar with port 3389, port 3389 is used for remote desktop protocol, which is the protocol used to remotely manage Windows servers. 
So for good measure, we're going to perform a brute force attack. So we're going to use Hydra, which again is part of Kali Linux. I've downloaded a password file from Git containing 2.1 million passwords. I'm going to assume the standard Windows administrator username, and we're just going to iterate through this and leave this running. Can we switch back to the slides, please? All right, so what did you guys think of this demo? All the trademarks of an expert UI design team, right? Look, for a business relying on its online presence, one guy with a laptop over there has caused chaos. Their website is currently offline. They cannot manage orders. They cannot manage their inventory. Personal identifiable information was just breached. And with the increase in data breach notification laws around the world, this could have real serious consequences for them. You know, it could be the end for them. But what's really scary is this all flew under the radar. And it's clear, if we're going to climb up the InfoSec maturity curve, we really need a smarter approach. And in order to do that, we need some new tools. And ideally, as a developer, I want to keep my requests as far away from my origin as possible, not only to improve my security posture, but to improve performance. And the first tool I'll be adding today is AWS Shield. AWS Shield is a fully managed, distributed denial of service protection service that safeguards applications on AWS. AWS Shield provides automatic, always on inline mitigation. So there is no need to contact AWS support to benefit from DDoS protection. It comes in two flavors, standard and advanced. Shield standard protects against most commonly and frequently occurring network and transport layer attacks. And what's more, it is completely free. However, when you combine CloudFront with Amazon Route 53 and Shield standard, you receive comprehensive protection against all known layer three and four attacks. For more advanced protection targeting your application, you can subscribe to Shield Advanced. So remember us in the previous demonstration or our malicious actor with his botnet army? Well, with Shield, these requests are going to be dropped at one of our 130 plus edge locations around the world. The next tool I'm going to add is AWS WAF. And AWS WAF is a web application firewall designed to safeguard your applications from common exploits that could compromise security, uh, consume excessive resources, and so on. It contains a full featured API, so you can tie AWS WAF in with your DevSecOps toolchain. So from initial creation through to deployment and maintenance of rules. I mentioned OWASP top 10 earlier. Well, with AWS WAF, you can mitigate against all known OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. It just doesn't mitigate against known keywords or patterns. It performs your old decoding to prevent encoding flying under the radar. Before, I was pretty successful in launching a multi-stage SQL injection. You know, this took a lot of time, and it flew past the built-in defenses of WordPress. But you know, once again, with our new tools, we're able to block these. And the same thing goes for any of the other OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. Whilst AWS WAF isn't going to be a silver bullet for lapsed coding standards, it is going to buy you time while your developers plug those gaps or you wait for a new version from your software vendor. So we've all been in the security caper long enough to know what I've shown you thus far. You know, it really isn't game changing. And you're right. You know, whilst these approaches may be better than what's traditionally available, it is still a game of cat and mouse. And whilst you struggle to get one step ahead, malicious actors are finding new and innovative ways to attack your organization. So I didn't come here today to teach you guys how to build a better candle. We're here today how to build a light bulb, self-defending borders. So we have some new architecture here. And the Key to our architecture is AWS WAF, but more specifically the web ACL, which will act as a central inspection and decisioning point for all incoming traffic. The protective functions of this architecture will determine what rules get applied and what rules get removed to AWS WAF, as well as other services contained within our architecture. Our domain is now resolving to an Amazon CloudFront distribution, which is being protected by Shield to allow only port 80 and 443 traffic. CloudFront is handling both static and dynamic content. And for content that cannot be delivered at the edge, it will be retrieved from our origin, which is our application load balancer. And to further increase our security posture, our application load balancer is set as such to only accept requests originating from Amazon CloudFront. Just as the saying goes, if you're not keeping score, well, it's just practice. All logs generated by CloudFront 
our application load balancer and our web servers, Apache, are being pushed into an Amazon S3 bucket, which will be ingested by our architecture to drive operational intelligence. And lastly, we have our honeypot endpoint, which is a security mechanism designed to lure and deflect incoming attacks. I chose WordPress today not only because it's popular, but because there is plenty of collateral available online on how to compromise and deface an unpatched, unsupported version of WordPress. Our honeypot will detect inbound requests from content scrapers and bad bots that don't obey our robots file, as well as those trying to access known application exploits to which we will take action. So I'm going to pause here and change gear because this is where this session gets real. We know AWS provides a suite of best-of-breed security services, but we provide a portfolio of building blocks to help you architect and develop robust security practices. There's Amazon SQS and Amazon SNS, our fully managed queuing and messaging platforms to help decouple your architectures. There's DynamoDB and Amazon S3, our durable and scalable storage services, perfect for audit trails and logs. And I've also listed quite a few non-security related services. And yes, this is a security session, and yes, it's on purpose. And that's because it's 2018. And in 2018, security can no longer be looked at in isolation. And it's these services that really help empower you to build modern, robust security architectures. The key to adding smarts into our border today is the use of AWS Lambda and AWS Step functions. These two services are giving us a capability to programmatically drive the configuration of AWS and external services, plus the capability to avoid false positives. Now, there might be a few of us in the room who aren't that familiar with Lambda and Step Functions, and look, that's OK. Let's just drop to a quick 101 overview. AWS Lambda is a serverless compute service that runs your code in response to events. In fact, it can run your code in response to many events, such as a file upload to Amazon S3, state change via AWS Step Functions, or a HTTP request with Amazon API Gateway. The code you write for Lambda is called a Lambda function, and it is ready to run as soon as it's triggered. Serverless means a simple but usable primitive. Your code as a Lambda function with nothing that looks like a server or a container. There is no need to worry about provisioning, configuring, and securing servers. And for the Microsoft people in the room, no more Patch Tuesday. Availability and scalability is managed by us. And unlike on-premises, container, or EC2, you don't pay for idle. You pay for compute time, which is the time it takes your functions to execute in units of 100 milliseconds. And that is why Lambda is perfect for our event-driven architecture. Equally as important, though, is AWS Step Functions. AWS Step Functions is part of the AWS serverless family, and it makes it really easy to orchestrate Lambda functions for serverless applications. If you're using Lambda today, I bet your applications have more than one function, one endpoint, one module. In fact, it's common to have lots of functions, and that's where Step Functions comes in. Step Functions is a reliable way to step through the functions of your application to ensure they run in the order as prescribed. Step Functions triggers and tracks each step, so if an issue does go wrong, you can quickly hone in and debug. So why Step Functions? Today, I'm using step functions as a common architectural pattern, but let's quickly talk through the use case with our honeypot. And it all starts when a request to our honeypot is made. So API Gateway is going to fulfill that request, and API Gateway is going to proxy that request through to our Lambda function. Our Lambda function is going to extract the IP address and the HTTP user agent, and it's going to pass this information and a few others into our state machine. And the first thing our state machine will do is try and deem, have I seen this attack type before? And it will do so by comparing the HTTP user agent against the DynamoDB table. If there's a match, we will automatically add the IP address into AWS WAF. Otherwise, we're going to contact our InfoSec team, and we're going to wait. We're going to ask them to manually review this. And assuming they deem this to be a malicious HTTP user agent, we will then update DynamoDB, put the user agent in, and add the IP address into AWS WAF. What I've built here is a reusable and extendable pattern that could be extended with multiple inputs, driving multiple outputs, and will be used throughout our self-defending architecture. We'll go back for you, sir. You right? <laughs> Can we switch a demo, please? 
All right, so we're back in Firefox here. We've got the same website. We've got a different URL in the corner. It's selfdefending.tsuec.com. It is the same website. It's got the same robots file. Everything's the same. But look, don't take my word for this. Let's take a look at the results of WP scan, to which we also ran earlier. And to make things a little bit clearer, let's diff the results. In the left, in red, we have our original architecture. In the right, in green, we have our self-defending architecture. We can see that the PHP version is still the same. The WordPress version is still the same. We've got the same vulnerabilities, different URLs, etc. But all in all, it's the same. But I'm not sure for those who are paying attention above, we've got some bits of different information here. We now have Amazon CloudFront sitting in the HTTP headers. And by virtue of using CloudFront with Route 53, we're protected by Shield Basic and all the features that Shield Basic provides. So before, I was pretty successful in launching a multi-stage SQL injection. Let's try that once again. So they've gone from having a terrible day to being able to detect, take programmatic action, and block this. All right, so look, that didn't work. WP scan still mentioned in the results that we're still vulnerable for a denial of service attack. So we're going to run the same script targeting our self-defending architecture. We'll run this from multiple SSH sessions in order to amplify the attack. And whilst this is running, let's jump back into Firefox. And in order to quantify the performance of this website, let's leverage Firefox Inspector. So we will refresh the page. Not only is the website online, but it is still extremely performant. And that is because Shield Standard and CloudFront are dropping these requests at one of our 130 plus edge locations. All right. So now let's try and rescrape this website. So we'll open up our scraping script. We'll pause there, Marcus, just for a moment. <laughs> Look, and as you can see, it's the same script as before. We're using curl, we're iterating through a loop, and we're pulling back some information with wget. Nothing too special going on here. All right, so we'll kick that off. And whilst that's running, let's jump back into Firefox for a second. Let's take a look at their robots file. Now, based on the robots file and the disallow section, compliant scripts and spiders should not go there. But the thing is, I'm a scraper, and I simply don't care. So I'm trying to scrape and extract as much information as I can. Now, whilst I was just uh, talking then, my phone has just started vibrating, and lo and behold, I've received a message. Now, I alluded to the fact earlier, I'm using Amazon Simple Notification Service today, not only to send a message to my phone, but I'm using it in a fan-out method to send messages to my email as well. So as we can see here, we've received an email saying our honeypot has, uh, activity has been detected. We've got the IP address, 54252156.11, and the user agent, wget1.19.4. And the reason we got this email is because we haven't seen this user agent before. And we can validate what's taken place in a few ways. We can drop back in the Kali Linux here, and we can take a look at the results of our scraping script. And we can see Lambda, or API Gateway, has proxied the request through to our Lambda function. And our Lambda function has returned you know, a cheeky message, thanks for the visit, with a, I, don't know, I think I removed the smiley face. Thanks for the visit and the IP address. Now, we got this message because, um, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into step functions right now. So what this has also done has started a, an active running state machine. So we're in the step functions console here. And we can see that our state machine has been initiated with a payload of JSON data. We've got the IP address, the user agent, and some other bits of arbitrary details. And we're currently in a wait condition, as indicated by the box in blue here. And the reason we're in a wait condition is because we haven't seen this attack type before. And we can validate this 
by going to our console here. I just crafted a script using the AWS CLI. So I'm asking, you know, asking DynamoDB, do you have any records with the user agent of wget 1.19.4? We have no records. So what we can now do, where you know, we've come to the conclusion this is malicious, we're going to go back into our email and we're going to approve this. And what's going to happen is the state machine task token is going to be passed back in via API Gateway. API Gateway is going to pass this through to our Lambda function, which is going to call our state machine back and execute the next Lambda function, update WAF badbot ACL, which it now has. And we can validate this you know, via a plethora of ways. We can, let's, let's go to the uh, command line. Or we, you know, we can look at the console here. Our IP address is now listed. We have the IP address of our Kali Linux instance. If we jump back to the console and take a look at our DynamoDB table, so now, rather than returning zero records, this user agent is listed. So, if we get a subsequent attack, we're automatically going to ban any IPs with this user agent who hits our site. But more importantly, I can just rerun the script. Rather than taking minutes to run and returning HTTP 200s, this is now only going to take a, sh a few short seconds and return HTTP 404s. Can we switch back to the slides, please? So, Hopefully, there are plenty of developers in the room here. But look, a development principle is to always use feedback loops. And this next function, I like to think as a safety mechanism, should our previous attempts be unsuccessful at catching the bad guys. I've added in another AWS service here, AWS Guard Duty. Now, AWS Guard Duty is a fully managed threat detection service that continuously monitors your account for suspicious or unauthorized behavior. And it does so by looking for unusual API calls, detects compromised EC2 instances, or those performing reconnaissance on your account. So you might ask, what value is GuardDuty providing us? Well, GuardDuty is providing us, the IPs who managed to hit our account, with suspicious or inconsistent behavior, as well as those who originate from third-party IP reputation lists, such as Spam House. Proof points drop list or the Tor exit node list. And I'll be taking the JSON output and feeding this into our Lambda step functions pattern. Guard duty generates its findings using three different data feeds. Firstly, we enable a duplicate VPC log stream. So there is no need for you to turn on VPC flow logs. So we're parsing your VPC flow data. On the DNS front, Queries made from your EC2 instances to questionable domains, e.g. your Bitcoin mining or something like that, or you know, part of a botnet that will get picked up, as well as your Route 53 logs, if you are using Amazon Route 53, are taken into account. Plus, your history of API calls detected by CloudTrail. That can be from the CLI, console, or SDK, but it also takes into account the IAM credentials and the IP address of those who are making that call. And that's all fed into Guard Duty to generate findings. And these findings are available in Amazon CloudWatch. So not only can you detect, but you can report and act via CloudWatch events. Today, I'm using step functions and Lambda. But you could very well send this to a seam or SOC using Amazon Simple Notification Service. You know, with so many choices available, it is really up to you. Can we cut back to the demo, please? All right. So if you remember, in the very first demo, we launched a brute force attack, leveraging Hydra running on Kali. And while speaking to you, my phone, once again, has started vibrating. So rather than look at my phone, I'm sure I received a message, let's jump back into our email here. And we can see that our brute force attack has been detected excuse me, by guard duty. And we've taken this JSON payload that guard duty generates, and we've fed this through our Lambda step function machine and generated a pretty email. But what this has also done has created another active state machine. But this time, we're not touching AWS WAF. We're going to manipulate the EC2 guest firewall. Now, look, we're nearing our time together today, and I hope I've established a bit of trust with you. But look. That's OK. I understand. I can be um, you know, critical at times. Just in case you think this is smoke and mirrors, we're going to telnet into our Bastion host. And as you can see, we can connect. 
Poor 3389, it works fine. So let's jump back into our email. We're going to approve this. And what it's going to do, we're going to flow back through API Gateway into Lambda, into our state machine, and execute our next Lambda function. Update EC2 guest firewall. All right, so that's taken place. Now, if we try and tell it back in, it doesn't work. So just like that, we have leveraged a guard duty finding to drive orchestration within our environment. And remember, look, this was just an example. You could extend this with multiple inputs, you know, multiple findings, feed that into your state machine, and drive multiple outputs out there. Can we switch back to the slides, please? So look, let's recap what we just saw. We have climbed the curve. We have taken the snowy unicorn elevator company from an architecture that was reactive and static and provided little to no visibility into one that is proactive, self-defending, and drives maturity within the organization. And we've done this not only by leveraging traditional security services, but by leveraging the services you see above. Services that were once the realm of architects and developers have augmented our architecture, providing us a pattern that will not only work for today, but scale for tomorrow, and all at the same time reducing our administrative overhead. Please see the following links to help you get started with Lambda and Step Functions, as well as two great blog posts to which this session was loosely based on. Now, I believe if you scan your badge on the way out, you'll receive these electronically, but I'll pause here to let you take a few photos. All right. And look, before I thank you. 